And we're live. <laughs> that was pretty quick. Um, how's it going, Justin? Welcome. Welcome to, Thank and, you. and everybody else that's here, welcome to an ESOP primer with KRP. We have Justin from KRP, one of the favorite accountants in the world, here to talk about an ESOP. I don't even, we'll talk about what it stands for in a couple seconds, but Justin, you want a couple, couple seconds of an intro here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks for that, uh, Tim. I'm a, uh, I'm a partner at KRP, uh, accounting firm here in Edmonton, uh, doing work with companies sort of uh, that run the gamut uh, in the technology and startup space. Uh, we, uh, we do work with the accounting side of things and helping people with their financial statements and their tax returns, but also uh, those unique uh, areas with respect to startups, SR and ED, just getting things set up initially, trying to, uh, to help you get set up with your bookkeeping and your record keeping and, and, and answering questions like this about uh, ESOPs and everything else. And Justin's fantastic. He takes... He answers his email. I don't know how, how do you stay on top of your emails? That's probably the most impressive skill. Uh, <laughs> he responds to anything within like 20 minutes, no matter how hard of a question you huck at him, he's, he's right at it. So it's super impressive. And, and, and just as a shameless plug, how early should people be talking to you both in terms of like in advance of needing work, but also in terms of like the life, life cycle and size of company and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. So ideally we're chatting with people, um, like I said, ideally, uh, before the, the company is even set up. Now that doesn't happen very often. Um, so typically I would say the, the normal time would be, you've got your, your company set up, uh, you've started, uh, trying to do your own record keeping. You've realized it's a little bit more of a pain than you had anticipated it would be. And that's when we start talking. Um, worst case scenario is we're chatting and you've already gone past, three year ends and now we've got a whole bunch of cleanup and fix up to do and things like that. But the earlier we get involved in that process, the better just because we can help with the planning uh, rather than trying to, to clean up messes, which can uh, sometimes cause more issues uh, at the end of the day. Totally. And I guess for the fullest of context, everybody here should probably know and probably does already know that KRP is a sponsor of, of Startup TNT. So they're, you know, they're not only, Justin's not only putting his time in to help, you know, toss out some, some thoughts when it comes to ESOPs and other things. He's also helping directly support Startup TNT. And I, I, I also want to make it really clear that we don't accept sponsorship from just anybody. We're picking what I believe or what we believe are the, the best companies in the space. Uh, I used to work at a big four and I know that they're hella expensive, especially for startups. And so, you know, really want to protect everybody that's sitting around this table. Um, and so I'd strongly recommend talking to, talking to Justin or, or somebody at KRP if, if you're looking for stuff. Um, but with that, he sobs. And, and for those of you, you know, if you're watching on YouTube, obviously you can't interact all that much. But if you're here on Zoom, please hop in with questions. Treat this as we bring up some topics. Please feel free to treat this like sort of a free consulting session because you have more interesting things off the top of your mind than I do as just coming up with random crap. So please, please hop in. Um, but Justin, what, what is an ESOP? What do those letters even stand for? Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and this is probably <laughs> as funny as it is, it's uh, people hear about ESOPs and they think, oh, that sounds great. I definitely want to do that. And they don't really know what it stands for. So uh, ESOP is Employee Stock Ownership Plan. Now, stock options play into that, uh, but really it's, it's an ownership plan. So it's a way to get employees ownership within your company. And, uh, and, and that's really, once you, once you get through that and kind of look at that as, as the, the name behind it, you can kind of understand there's a lot of different ways that we can go about um, getting to that point. Uh, we'll go through those today, uh, the different options available and the, and sorry, that was poor choice of word options, uh, different uh, uh, areas we can look at that are available, but, uh, but really it comes down to getting ownership of the company into the hands of your employees one way or another. And so what are the, I mean, in, in my head, you have sort of options or you have shares and there's a whole bunch of mechanics that sit behind both of those. Is there another one as well, or, or is that, is that the list? No, that's really the two, but then each of those has different branches and it breaks down. So in its absolute simplest form, um, you have shares 
in your company. And based on maybe some sort of predetermined schedule, your employees can buy those shares. Uh, and maybe it's a, as a, a way to give them initial ownership, or maybe it's a way for an exit strategy for you. I mean, depending on the, the stage of the company and what you're looking at, they can, they can vary quite significantly. Um, you can then get into options, which is basically an opportunity to set a price of a share of a company, which then the, the employee can buy those shares at a later point down the road uh, based on the price that you determine today. So there's, we're th there's that. And then in that situation, the employee doesn't necessarily have to buy the shares. They, it's their option. They, they, they make that decision down the road. Then you have other situations like restricted stock option plans where they have ownership of the company, but they don't necessarily get to do anything with it. They can't sell it. They can't uh, really do much outside of that. You can have plans as well set up where everything is held within a trust and the employees just own that trust or have an interest in that trust. And, uh, and then they don't actually ever own the company itself. They own the trust that owns the company. So there's a lot of different uh, structures that can be played with. All right. We're nerding out on employee stock ownership plans. The most common one for startups is which? The, the most common is the stock option plan. And probably because that seems to be the most commonly known plan. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best for you, but it is definitely the, the, the most commonly seen plan. And that would be a, a plan where you would give your employees over a certain period of time, typically tied to how long they've been working with the company, um, a certain number of options, a right to, to make a purchase into the company. And that's set on a price at today. So whatever the company's worth today, that's what you're going to let them buy in for, or maybe slightly higher than that. You never want to go lower. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but you never want to go lower than what the company's worth today. You only want to go with the value of the company today or the value tomorrow. And then over a period of time, we have something called a vesting period where employees can then buy into the company over a period of time. Once those shares or options vest, basically making them uh, available for the employees to purchase into buy into the company. And, uh, and then when the company eventually sells down the road in an exit plan, or if the employee leaves, then you buy those shares back and, uh, and they've received the benefit of the lift in the value of the company over that period of time. And, and, and ultimately, I guess, at the end of the day, what you're really hoping to do is incentivize your employees in some way to push the value of the company up by doing everything they can to, to grow the company. And, uh, and then they receive a benefit uh, directly tied to the growth of the company rather than just tied to their salary. Awesome. And how, let's, let's dive into some of the brief mechanics and some of the lingo that's, that's used there. So um, can you explain? Absolutely, the absolutely. So, so you'll see a lot of this when you're dealing with options. Um, there's something called the strike price. That's the price that you agree to sell the shares of the company uh, to the employee at. You have something called the vesting period. The vesting period is the, the time that um, when, when options are granted, uh, let's say they're granted today, June 7th, um, they're there, but they're not really worth a whole lot to the employee because the employee can't do anything with them. Once you hit the vesting date, that's the date that the employee can actually exercise those options and, and buy the shares. That period between the grant date and the vesting date, that's called the vesting period. That's basically just a, a no fly zone. It's, it's, a, it's a period where nobody can really do anything. The, the options are there, but they're not really available to the employee. Uh, there's, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Those are probably the key timelines and the key terms that you're looking at. Um, I suppose as well, one of, the, one of the key items that you have to consider is the company's share price. So what's the price at the date that the options are initially issued? Um, and, and that's basically what the, the shares of the company are worth. A very common term, of course, I'm sure you've all heard of it, but, uh, but just, uh, just in case you haven't. Oh, you're on mute, Tim. Okay, well, with that, since Tim's uh, having some technical difficulties here, I, I'll, uh, I'll talk about some I'm of back. the... Uh, oh, you're back. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so you're talking about the price. 
Um, and I've seen this happen a number of times where people are doing options for a penny each or, or like for a penny strike and, and stuff like that, or trying to figure out this is a massive hangout point. Uh, I've had a number of conversations on this. So can we maybe dive into this a little bit? Can you unpack, you know, why, why does, how about the, why does this matter before we get into the, the actual numbers on this? Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Lots of, lots of companies will do this where they just, uh, um, they set everything with a one penny price because they want to give the, the employees the benefit. They, they, they want the employees to, uh, um, receive all of the lift in the value of the company. And, and this is really an incentive for them, but the, it ends up being maybe a negative incentive in ways that, uh, that can be prevented. And, and so when you issue options in a company, it needs to be done at the value of the company at that date or a value greater than what the company is at that date. And the reason being is if it's at a value below the, um, uh, the value of the company at that date, then technically you've just given the employee a benefit. But what you've done is by giving them that benefit, you've caused a negative tax consequence to them. So let's go, go through an example. Let's say the shares of the company, you've just done a, a, a seed round and you've issued shares of the company at a uh, dollar a share. And you issue options for an employee at a dollar a share. And in five years time, or let's say a year later, they exercise those options. So they own these shares at $1 per share. And then in five years time, the employee goes ahead and sells those shares. Well, the, the gain, the $1 versus whatever the selling price is, that ends up being treated as very, there's some technicalities behind it, but really it's treated very similar to a capital gain, in which case you only pay tax on half of that lift. Now, if an employee is to receive, you've just done your seed round, we'll go back to the original example, you've just done your seed round and you've raised share or you raised capital at a dollar a share, and then you issue uh, a bunch of options to your employees subsequent to that point at a penny a share. And then five years down the road, the company sells, the employee exercises their options. Well, no longer do you get that similar to capital gains treatment. It's basically all treated as regular income. So what you've immediately done was while you thought you were doing the employee a benefit, and I mean, you were, uh, but you're, you're costing them double the tax on a situation like that, that they wouldn't have incurred normally had you issued the options at the actual uh, value uh, that the company was or slightly above the value. I mean, there's incentives to doing that as well, but as long as it's at or above, you get the, ben the employees get the beneficial tax treatment that they wouldn't otherwise receive. And so what happens, there's a few, few paths to go down here. So for those yeah. that have issued at a penny already, um, is what's the sort of suggested mechanic or, you know, a, what's the suite of tools that exist to sort of unwind those tax consequences? From yeah. So it, it's, if, if the shares have been, um, or if, sorry, if the options have been issued and the employees exercise those options, we're pretty stuck. Really, you can, uh, you can buy them back. There will be some potential tax consequences. If the options have been issued though, and they haven't been exercised, because quite often what ends up happening is the employee uh, stock options are issued, but the employees don't exercise them and they typically don't exercise them until right before an exit. Um, and, and that's quite often the, uh, the, uh, the nature of it. Obviously employees don't wanna just give you money. Um, uh, they still get the same benefit of ownership essentially by having these options. So if that's the case, then those options can simply be canceled and new options issued. And that's easy enough to do. Now, with that said, if options were issued today and the company was worth a dollar a share, and then you do a capital raise down the road, and the, at that point, the company is worth $5 a share, that doesn't mean you have to do anything with the previous options, as long as those options were issued at the fair value at that date. That's the key thing to keep in mind. So it's only an issue if you go back to my, my previous example, if the company was worth $5 a share and you issued the options at $1 a share, that would be, that would be where you want to look at maybe canceling those options and reissuing the options to the employee. And once again, at the, uh, with, with these transactions, especially if the employees are not exercising the options until there's a sale, maybe the employee doesn't want to have new options. So it's definitely something you'd want to have a discussion with the employee about. They might be okay with the negative tax consequences just because they're getting more proceeds and they're receiving really money 
uh, in their pocket at the end of the day. They won't end up behind uh, regardless of the situation. And one of the other things, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm definitely not the smart person in the room here, but I, I, uh, if you hold, if you exercise and then hold the physical shares or whatever, they're not physical, but you know, you hold the shares for, for two years, does that also help avoid some stuff here or is, am I making things up? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's a key part of the, the process. If employees exercise those options and they have the ownership of the shares and they hold those shares for two years, then there's really no negative tax consequences as a result of receiving those options. So that's something to keep in mind as well. But the key thing is that two years. So it doesn't necessarily work if you have a situation where the employee is exercising the options immediately prior to a sale, because then uh, you're, you're, uh, you're not meeting that two year holding period. Cool. So like if it's, if you exercise and there's a transaction within two years, it's the fancy not capital gain situation where there's some stuff going on, but it can be treated like it if it hits the certain criteria. And then after two years, it's just straight up capital gains. Is that sort of how it works? Effectively. Yeah, that's effectively how it would work. Yeah, it's in. And I, I, I keep saying effectively or, or it, it's not technically capital gains treatment, but it follows it exactly. So I don't want to get things too complicated. But uh, uh, but just so you're aware, it's not a capital gains treatment, but the tax works out exactly the same. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, okay, so the other and, and like I said, feel free to hop in with questions. We're just sort of like bouncing off of each other and, and trying to remember the path of the conversation. So if you have questions, feel free to hop in and, and we'll dive into that. Um, the, the other half of this was sort of how to determine price. So especially for folks that have done a say a safe or a convertible note um, or, or even like a pref round, which isn't commons because those are different securities as well. Like, can you maybe sort of unpack all of that, especially for yeah, early, and it's tough to be to be honest with you. This is probably the trickiest part of the whole pro. Well, there's two two parts. I'll, I'll get into the second part uh, in a little bit. Uh, but with respect to determining the value, if you haven't done a recent raise, it's coming down to uh, valuation process of, of determining the value. Now, typically, when you're dealing with a startup and you're dealing with uh, something in the technology space, coming up with a reasonable value is very very tough. And there's no right or wrong answer. So you just have to go through a reasonable process to go, here's how we determined what the value of our shares were based on our technology, based on maybe some other financing that was received. Um, you mentioned PREF shares. That's while they're, you're absolutely correct, they're not uh, common shares of a company, but they can somewhat um, suggest an overall value of the company. Uh, I would say another option is to uh, have a formal valuation completed. Um, it's tough just because you've got a technology that's not revenue producing necessarily. So that makes things quite difficult in terms of determining what that value is and having that valuation report come back with a number that's not your company's worth anywhere between 500,000 and 200 million. Um, that doesn't provide a great, uh, great bit of information. But once you've got maybe a, a formalized process set up, you can continue to apply that process. And when I say a formalized process, it might be based on number of users for your software. Uh, it might be tied to um, the increase in revenue, not necessarily directly tied to income. You're not going to be looking at things like uh, EBITDA, uh, earnings before interest, tax, uh, depreciation, amortization. Um, you're not going to look at those kind of basis as sort of the standard basis. You're going to have to use um, more unusual uh, or uh, non-traditional valuation techniques. And who, and we're trying to convince the CRA on this, that there's some sort of like reasonable justification for this. And have, how uh, has it, have, has the CRA ever actually like looked at it that hard? Like, have you give a, give a story on this? You know what, they really don't look at it extremely closely, but they can. And that's always the risk is they can. And the last thing you want to do is come up with a, uh, uh, a number uh, out of the air just saying, yeah, my company's worth this and have no basis and background into it. And we, we have had a situation in the past. It's, it's not, they didn't look at it yeah, extremely closely, but we, we have had a situation in the past where there was a company that did have a stock option plan. They did sell and CRA did look at the transaction and they came back on the valuation. Uh, and in this situation, and this is just one situation, doesn't necessarily mean it's always the case, 
But this company had a very formulaic process where they said, based on uh, three factors that they, they worked into their calculation, they come up with, this is how we determine the value. We allow, and, and they did it on a an very regular annual basis on when options would be issued and on the basis of what the employees were doing and their, the time that they'd been working with the company. And CRA looked at that and reviewed it. And they said, well, you had a reasonable process and we don't necessarily have any way to disagree with you or that this was the value of the company, but it was based on logical process and, and, and thought. And, and as a result, they did accept that. So um, once again, that wasn't the key focus of their audit, but they did look at this case and they, they were comfortable with that, that process to determine what the value was. Interesting. Cool. As long as, it, I mean, a penny is just not enough justification. And most recent priced round is probably pretty good justification. And there's probably like an aggressive position in between that could probably be taken if people. Yeah, were- absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say that, uh, but typically, yeah, you're right. If, if you've had any kind of capital raise within the last year, that's a great basis for what the value would be. And typically what we, what we do, because companies don't raise capital every three months. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to, but the, but it's just not the way it goes. Um, usually if you can use the basis for how that seed round or, or funding round uh, was determined for the value at that point and apply that to your option plans going forward or your ownership plans going forward, that's a great way to, uh, uh, to base value. And then you've got a supportable real life transaction uh, behind that. Cool. I, uh, Okay, let's nerd out on more tax things. This one wasn't okay. on the list. So lifetime capital gains exemption, I don't know, QS, B, whatever the letters are. Um, does, that, does that come into effect in anything here? What's the, how do, we, how do we get that? How do we get not just half tax off, but all tax off for people? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the lifetime capital gains exemption is something that's provided to individuals holding shares of, um, individuals holding shares of private companies that meet a certain criteria. Basically, you have to have a majority of your assets tied to uh, the actual operations. You can't have a company that's just sitting on an investment portfolio, for example. Uh, But as long as that happens and you're owning those shares personally and you sell those shares, you can qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption, which means gains of roughly, it's indexed to, to follow inflation each year. So it'd probably pick a big jump up this year but it's, it's right around $900,000 and you can receive that tax free. Um, and, uh, and if you do that, then, then the employees would pay no tax on any of those, uh, those gains related to, to the share sale. Now, the issue that comes into play is it's all about the timing of what the lift is and what the value is. And, and with the employees, there's a, there's a considerations between the option exercise price, the share price at that date, the lift on that. So everybody's situation is going to be a little bit different. But as long as those employees are holding those shares personally, they do have a potential option to, uh, to utilize that lifetime capital gains exemption. And maybe just to, to run this through a little bit, do you have, uh, do you have an example of a time when, when they would not qualify for that and a time when they would? Yeah, absolutely. So the, going back to the, uh, the initial example that I was mentioning before, where uh, the employee doesn't exercise their options until immediately before the sale, uh, that's going to be a situation where it's not going to qualify for the lifetime capital gains exemption. Because as I mentioned before, we're dealing with a situation where it's not necessarily um, uh, capital gains treatment. It just mimics capital gains in a lot of ways. So those would be a situation where it wouldn't. But let's say you had a situation where we're not going to the option plan, but maybe we're going to the employee stock ownership plan where actual shares are made available for employees to buy. If the employee just buys in those shares and holds those shares, then they could be potentially uh, uh, available to use the lifetime capital gains exemption on in those situations. Cool. Um, Okay, so if they have to hold it for a while, and now I'm just going to make up esoteric financial products and see how see how see how far down the path we can we can go together. So I I thought about this because I was going through this with the with the last startup that we were doing because we had done the penny a share shit and then we screwed everything up. And so we, um, we were thinking about doing it as sort of like a non, uh, cause the employee, the issue is that the employee has to outlay cash in order to, in order to swap from options to shares cause they have to pay the strike price in order to make that happen. That's right. Um, 
And so what we were thinking was doing sort of a non-recourse loan for the value, like for the price that they would have to pay. So say the employee has to, you know, outlay 50 grand in order to get the, to swap from options to shares, give them a non-recourse loan tied to the value of the shares. So if it, you know, they don't have to actually outlay cash, the thing goes up, life is grand. And if it goes, the company goes to zero, which is, you know, an unfortunate all too real option in the, in the path of things, then if it's non-recourse, then they wouldn't have to pay it back because it's tied to those assets. Is that, and recognizing that you're hearing this for the first time in the last 30 seconds, I'll just ramble for a couple more seconds before you have to respond. But, um, you know, maybe like, have you seen that before? Is there like crazy tax consequences? Am I like completely out to lunch? Why have I not heard of this some more? Like, like what's going on? Yeah. So, so the, the key word that you said in all of that was the non-recourse. If you're, you, it, the, what's going to ha- end up happening in that situation is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to consider is it is, um, that is a, um, it's essentially income. The employee, if they, if they only have to pay it back, if things go well for them, and, and if anything goes sideways, they don't have to pay it back, that's going to be treated as income to those employees. And that's, that's the biggest issue that you face in, in something like that is, um, is that, yeah, then, then they're paying tax on that income that they've received. And, and then, I mean, they have the options. Uh, so, the, so then the company goes sideways, like, you know, in that previous example with numbers, you know, they get that $50,000 loan, it gets written off. Now they don't have a job, they don't have the shares and they have tax on the 50K considered as income when things all went sideways. That's exactly right. That's Lots exactly right. So typically what, you, what you'll see in a situation like that is maybe you'll have either um, a bonus, depending cash flow permitting, uh, issued to the employees so that they can exercise those options. And it's not necessarily a negative overall situation for the company. Bonus money goes out, employee exercises the options, and the money comes back in minus the tax that the employee has to pay on that bonus. So that's one option. Another option is sometimes companies will execute, and this is typically a little bit later in the um, in the uh, life cycle of the company, not typically as a startup position, but it can be done is you'll have cashless options. So basically what ends up happening is options are issued for a dollar, value goes up to a dollar 50. And so rather than really executing the entire option transaction, the company goes, okay, well, we see this lift of 50 cents. We'll act as if you exercised your options and then we immediately bought those shares back. So you get your bonus for that 50 cent lift in the options or in the shares, I should say. And once again, it's a cash outflow for the company. So the company has to be in a strong cash position to be able to do that. Uh, but that's, that happens quite often as well because sometimes employees just don't have the cash to be able to exercise those options. Mm. Interesting. Okay, and Amanda, I'll get, I'll get to your question in, in a couple seconds, um, but Adrian had a, had a pretty good one. So um, if, you know, maybe on the other side of the, of the penny, strike situation i've also seen where companies will issue um uh where the expiry will be too short so like maybe maybe in an ideal world when what would the expiry be because there's you know the vesting period um maybe just to you know reiterate that one and then when would expiry ideally be and can you just kind of as a company unilaterally extend it for them and are there consequences of doing so yeah, so, so the vesting period, again, remember, is the period between the grant dates, so when you've given the options to the employees, and when they can actually execute on those options. Um, typically, you want that date, or the timing between those two, to sort of be uh, a period to allow the employees to show their commitment, I suppose, right? It, it, it's it's, uh, it's the, the carrot uh, that, that you're giving them basically saying, I'm giving you these options, but you don't actually get to do anything with them if you leave before one year or six months or whatever it happens to be. So, so that's really what the, the whole point of that vesting period is. Um, so in, in an ideal situation, when you don't know what you're going to, when you're going to sell, I would say typically what we, what we suggest is if you have a plan in place on when you're hoping to or expecting to be able to sell the company or exit the company, um, you work that into your option pricing period and, or option pricing period, option life period, and then extend it by three or four years. 
just because what we typically see is, you know, you can, you can put it down in an Excel spreadsheet and think that that's exactly the way it's going to work out. And it doesn't. And sometimes there's negotiation periods and things like that that make transactions take a little bit longer to close. So that gives you a, a typically a healthy buffer uh, in the amount of the life of the options as you can do that. Quite often people think about options as just three years and then they're done, uh, which is fine, but it's, it's often too short of a period. And is there a consequence to having, you know, three years, five years, 10 years, a hundred years, like what, why does that, like, why not just like have a ridiculously long expiration date? You can, there's no negative consequence to that with the exception of the fact that um, it depends on the, the details that are in your option agreement itself. So quite often what will happen is employees that have options that leave the company, um, they forfeit those options. They're, they, they all, they're all canceled at that point. Sometimes, if you issue options on day one of your company, now nobody would do that, but day one of your company and you have a hundred year life to them, um, that's quite a long period of time to see fluctuations and uptick in the value. And eventually they somewhat lose their um, purpose. I mean, the, the, the underlying purpose of having these options available to, uh, to employees is to give, give them the feeling of ownership within the company, give them the sense of, uh, accountability tied to the company, trying to, to help create the value in the company so it can ultimately sell. And if you stretch out that lifetime for too long, somebody's not going to remember necessarily something that they received 10, 15 years ago. Now, obviously, we're looking for exits shorter period of time than that, but still, it's there, there's some sort of mental aspect to it, so to speak. So, and, and so if you issued them, uh, Adrian, you raised your hand, but if, uh, if you have another question, we'll get, we'll do that. And you'll, I'll, I don't know how to unmute you. Um, but, <laughs> um, the, oh, you can unmute. Look at that. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. I would just want to expand on that a little bit. Okay. So the plan really, I guess the question is, can you extend if I issue say seven year options and we're going to sell maybe on year eight or nine, we think, and we thought maybe we would do it by six or seven and we're not quite there. Can, can I extend those three years? Or do I then have to, my employees have to fund money to, uh, to buy their, to exercise their options effectively to hold the shares before sale? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the answer, uh, of course, as it often is with accounting and legal is maybe. Uh, it, it will come down to the way the options are drafted uh, initially, whether you can, uh, whether you can or can't extend that lifetime. So you want to make sure, obviously, you're not just writing these option agreements on the back of a napkin. You want to make sure you have a lawyer involved to allow that uh, extendability. And if you don't do that properly right from the start, you can't. You're stuck with the option life as it is. And the only way you can get additional life added to that is essentially canceling those options and issuing new options. But then you go back to the initial comment that I'd made uh, sort of at the beginning of this, uh, where it has to be done at the, uh, the option price has to be issued at the fair value. So uh, in that period of time, if you're realizing in year six, oh, we should have, we should have extended the, or we should have had eight or nine year life, um, then you're looking at the value at year six, which would in theory be significantly higher than it was six years prior. Okay. And I came in, apologies, I came in a little late. I was in a, a different session I, uh, by accident. Um, you were saying the penny option, penny shares. Um, I think what you meant there is if you issue shares at a price, uh, below your fair value, then the CRA is going to have a problem with that, right? Um, yeah. But if you issue shares on day one or sometime in the first year when your company doesn't have a fixed price, you can you can set those at a, a penny a share or, or a fraction of a penny of a share, and that doesn't matter, right? Because you you basically that's your incorporation price. Yeah, really. I mean, when a company is incorporated, uh, quite often you'll have a hundred shares issued for a hundred dollars. So. If you're issuing options at a penny or whatever it happens to be, there's no value because there's nothing in the company, right? Right as a shell date, but you'd have to do that right from the start. Um, so, so it would really be uh, you, like, like, okay. So in our case, we, I mean, so the, the my co-founders started the company about eight months before I joined, but I got my shares at the same price, and the company had no no traction, really, no revenue, nothing to support an increased valuation. So, right at the start is somewhat of subjective, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, within the first year, you ha probably have a pretty good argument. Now you want to make sure you have that argument. You don't just go, it's a penny because, because it's eight months. 
that big things can happen in an eight month period, right? You could have technology rolled into the company. You could have a major breakthrough, some sort of uh, significant impact to, that would suggest that maybe there is value that's built into that. But if really nothing's happened, the company hasn't incurred a great deal of expenses. It's been mostly just groundwork by the founders, uh, discussions, um, internal work, nothing that's really showing up on paper. There's, you can probably argue that, but you want to make sure you'd had that uh, argument put in paper because uh, the sooner you do that uh, right at the beginning, it's easier to remember what happened in the first eight months today than it, it's going to, to be in five years from now. Okay, so I don't have that argument written in paper. So Tim, do we have to write this argument down on paper for me? <laughs> I would. I would strongly suggest you do. Uh, if, if you have something that you can support your position on today, and if, if CRA is ever to look at it and ask the question, you're not going, oh, well, here's what we were thinking five years ago, rather than going, let me go into my file folder, pull out this document, or go onto my computer, of course, and, and grab the document that I actually, we, we, why we came to that value five years ago. Here's the support for it. Okay. Um, and so we talked about sort of the, it depends on moving expiry, which has an, has an implication on the value of the option based on how you value options, but not really a tax consequence because the CRA doesn't, I don't know, understand how to value options. But the, the moving the strike price we sort of talked about as you'd have to cancel and, and reissue at the current value and not, you know, we issued in this is like January 1, 2019. And the value, the value it should have been is a dollar and it was actually a penny, but now we're fixing it in mid 22 and we have to run with the 22 price. We can't just, can't just go and fix the, you know, cause it was in 2019. We can't just like edit it. Yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. I mean, the, the it, technically they're different options, right? So if you've changed the terms of the options and you have to consider everything that's involved in that, that's why I said it's very important uh, to have the option agreements drafted properly in the first place to allow for that potential. Once again, the ideal situation is just adding a very long uh, option life uh, that you think will cover your exit date plus a few years just to, to make sure that you're covered off in case things don't go exactly according to plan. All right, so to recap, strike price, add the value of the company or higher. Or higher, offer. or higher. Option life, the expiry being like, we'll call it some ridiculously long period of time. So you don't have to deal with this as a problem when you're like, you know, worth a billion dollars in the company and you have your, you know, early employees now need to outlay cash in order to stick around because that's a little tricky. Um, what else should we be thinking about, Justin? When, when do we, and, and did I miss, I mean, we kind of just talked about those couple things in, in pretty decent depth. Um, but, you know, at what point, uh, you know, maybe, Maybe what, what can an ESOP help out with? Like why, why should somebody be considering this um, in their startup journey? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's sort of two, two reasons you're going to want to look at that. One is it is a low current cost, higher long-term cost, I suppose, option to retain good talent. Uh, if you've got people working for you, this is a great way to incentivize them to want to continue to work for you. Um, and it also creates that, uh, I mentioned this before, but it creates that ownership and accountability to your staff to, to want to try to grow the company and, uh, and do what's best for the company because they're going to receive a, uh, a benefit from that at the end of the day. Now I say it's a low current cost because you can issue options today and it's not really going to cost you much more than the professional fees required to get everything set up. Um, it's, a can be a potential long-term cost though, because you're diluting your ownership. And so you always want to keep that in mind, right? Today, day one, you own hundred percent of the company. If you start issuing options, maybe you don't own that hundred percent by the time you sell. Maybe at the time you sell, you own 50% of the company, depending on how many options you've issued. And so that's obviously the, the, but the motivation behind it is obviously trying to retain and attract and, uh, and motivate uh, your, your key employees. That's the key thing to do. And so I see the, the question from uh, Amanda on uh, at what point in your company life should you, uh, should you look at introducing ESOPs? The answer is um, 
The answer is tricky because there's no, there's no 100% correct answer. Oh, by year two, you should definitely be, uh, definitely be doing this. You need to look at your specific situation and determine, do, do you think this will actually motivate the staff the way you want to, to motivate them? Um, just because without, uh, uh, without that, sometimes people are issuing options and going through these very complicated option plans and, and determining when employees receive options and everything else. And it's not, not necessarily motivating the staff in the way that, uh, uh, the way that's intended, uh, because maybe the staff are motivated by something else. You need to know your staff and the situation uh, that you're facing and, uh, and, and see if it's, uh, if this is going to, to tie into that. But as soon as you see that, that will be the time to start thinking about it. Um, you don't want to, I would strongly advise against, and, and I mean, this is probably strange to hear one of the people involved with the planning of the process, but um, I would strongly advise against doing this too early because there's so much that changes in startups so quickly that what we've seen quite often is an option plan gets set up by uh, founders of a company who think this is the best way that, uh, uh, that we should set this up. And six to eight months, it doesn't take long, six to eight months later, um, the thought process of what was going to be beneficial to getting the options to the employees and the actual process is completely different and, and the entire plan has to be uh, adjusted and amended just to line up with what the reality is when they're actually issuing those options. So it's good to have something thought of in the back of your mind, but I wouldn't necessarily go ahead with the full plan until, until you're really ready to execute it. Cool. Um, all right. Kelly's asking about uh, essentially how much do you give to each employee? Um, are you involved in these in these sorts of conversations, or or how how what's what's sort of your your involvement here? Yeah, absolutely. So so there's there's a couple of things I would keep uh, uh, I would keep in mind when doing uh, looking at this. Now there's not there's not a perfect formula. So sorry, Kelly. I know it would be awesome if we could just punch it into a calculator and determine exactly how much you should issue. Um, there's no right or wrong way on how to do it. I've seen companies go from we only issue to you know employees that were um that were with us from day one or two and only the um developers or only the engineers that are involved in in the, the development of the technology we're looking at um i've seen other companies go all the way from the most key employee um you know, CEO, if that's not you as the founder, all the way to the receptionist. They just give them to everybody. Everybody gets options. Um, so there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, I would say what your focus should be is who do you want to retain? And what roles do you want to retain? And who do you want to incentivize? Uh, I'm personally of the opinion, if you're more of an administrative type role, it's nice. To, to provide them with options, but that the that's not necessarily going to result in an increased value of your company necessarily, as much as somebody who's actually in the uh, in the development stage of the entire process. So, but but once again, it's an opinion, and it depends on the culture uh, of your organization itself. Um, in terms of the length of time uh, that they've worked for you, I don't like to give options personally to anyone who's been there for such a short period of time. Typically, we see anybody who's been there for at least a year um, uh, should, should be who you're, uh, you're looking at options for. Um, and it might be longer than that. It depends on, on really, the once again, the nature of the company and, and who's been with you and who you want to keep around. For sure. And I, I, I put it in the chat and for folks watching this on YouTube, Amanda's here and she's going to pull together an awesome blog for us. So there's like a written component, written version of this sort of conversation distilled to its salient points. Um, and we'll include this link in, in that as well. Um, but essentially this is a, it's a medium post blog article thing um, that has a few decent uh, sort of like Google sheets calculator type things um, for how much, uh, it, it's, you know, again, like there, it's an, it's an art more than anything. Um, but to help drive the conversation around how much the options are worth, because they're not, 
they're not worth the strike price. So if you issue, you know, uh, you say fifty thousand dollars of strike price of of options uh, to somebody, it's that those options because you're they have to pay the fifty thousand in order to get the fifty thousand dollars of shares. The value, um, the value is the fact that they don't have to pay the fifty thousand dollars in order to get the lift on owning fifty thousand dollars of shares. And so it's a bit of a nuance, but it's it's a valuable thing to keep in mind. And so you know, early enough in a company's life cycle, we'll call it directionally similar um, in value. Um, but as you get a little bit later and the company gets to be worth a bunch more and we'll say the volatility decreases a little bit as you get closer to exit and stuff like that, then, then the conversation changes a bit. And so there's a, there's a pretty good, you know, few links in there, um, that I've used when, when talking to companies, um, and, and helping figure out how much to give to various people and stuff like that, and like a table on whatever, how much for, to, to, to each type of employee and stuff like that. Um, Julia has a has a long one then because I was rambling. I haven't been able to watch, haven't been able to look at it. Um, Justin, have you have you looked at this question yet? No, no, no. But we can. I'll, uh, I'll read it. I'll read it out loud so right. we can think together. Options newbie here. I have two questions. What are some key options agreement characteristics that typically differ when issuing stock options for hiring C suite talent that you can't fully compensate yet, versus motivating employees that you have the funds to compensate but want to reward and motivate them further. For example, in the first scenario, are they typically voting shares? Um, and the second question I just sort of talked about, um, and maybe there's some other uh, resources and websites to point people to, but yeah, absolutely. Stuff. So, so, so on that, I would say the, the, the key characteristic difference between C-suite versus motivating employees in general is quantum. You're, you're really just looking at the amount of options. Um, the motivating staff uh, at maybe at a non C-suite level, you can typically do that with a lower number of shares. Uh, and, and there's, and I don't love to say this, but they don't really see a huge difference in the, in the amount. They're not looking necessarily percentage ownership of the entity. They're looking at more of the fact that I own some shares, so I'm, I'm happy or I have an option to buy some shares. C-suite employees are typically more sophisticated in terms of the financial reporting side of things. They understand that if you just give them a thousand uh, options and you have a million shares outstanding, that it means effectively nothing to them uh, at the end of the day. And they can do the math on determining if the company sells for X dollars, I'm not really going to be getting that much. So that's typically what you want to do. And, and quite often with the C-suite side of things, you're working that into a determination of overall compensation. So what you're paying them in cash or, or a regular salary, and you're adding these options as sort of an overall compensation package. And that really works into that number as well. Now, with that said, what we often recommend to, um, to all founders who are looking at uh, issuing the options, and it goes into the sort of the second point of, uh, of what you, uh, um, of what you've um, mentioned here in your question was I often recommend that the organizations have their initial shares that have been issued, uh, which are voting shares. And then you have other common shares that maybe are non-voting common shares, class B, class C, class D. It doesn't really matter what the class is, but they're typically common non-voting shares. And that's what you'll issue the options uh, on basically that they can exercise and access those because the last thing you want to do as a founder is have a bunch of employees all receiving options on common voting shares that then all have a say on the operations of the company should they actually exercise those shares and quite often when you're setting up your company initially you'll set up your initial uh, articles of incorporation and there might be certain provisions within those articles that say you need 100% uh, vote to make transaction X occur. And if you've given options to employees that they have one share, and but it's a common voting share, and they don't vote in the same direction that you, uh, you would expect them to, that can kill a deal. So if you, as the founder or with your partners, 
or venture capital. Sometimes uh, when, when VC comes in, they want a, a ownership percentage as well, like a, not just an ownership percentage, but a voting percentage. Um, then you can issue from that pool. But options can be issued on a separate pool that's, once again, non-voting, still gives the employees the same lift and value and the impact if there's a subsequent sale, but uh, doesn't necessarily get them involved in the regular governance and, and oversight of the company that you'd want to keep to yourself uh, as the founders. And Adrian, I'll, I'll get to your question, but it's written there, so I can't forget it, whereas the one in my head, I'll probably forget if I don't get it off right now. So the... Uh, you know, there's sort of this like governance issue and, and, and stuff like that that we're talking about when it comes to company ownership. And um, one of the things we haven't quite talked about yet is around terminated employees and, and sort of walking through what happens there. Maybe, maybe if you can walk through sort of a couple examples and, and um, there are a couple of scenarios, um, you know, one on where uh, an employee has been issued options they're vested, which means that they have the ability to exercise them and they haven't exercised them yet. Um, and what sort of the ideal path is there. Uh, and then, you know, one where they have been, you know, they've gotten the options and they've chosen to exercise them. So they own the shares and sort of what the ideal path is on, on that pathway. And you sort of, you know, talk about terminated employees essentially. Yeah, absolutely. So some people have no issues with terminated employees holding options and holding shares. So uh, it, it, that seems to be the rarity. Um, and I can understand that completely. You don't just want uh, anybody not involved, maybe involved with a competitor that um, that's owning shares of, of the company or owning options in the company. So typically what happens when you have an employee that has options, but hasn't exercised those options. And so just holds them is Upon termination, and, and this is going to get into uh, employment law uh, and, and things like that as well, but quite often what, what ends up happening is the employee's agreement and the option agreement notes that uh, for on uh, their voluntary leaving of the company or uh, right, uh, not wrongful dismissal situations, but if, if they're terminated with cause, then all the options are uh, forfeited. So, so they're just lost at that point. Whether they vested or not, they're, they're lost. And, and that's quite common to do something like that and, and honestly recommend it. In terms of situations where you have an employee who has options, they've exercised those options, so now they own shares. Typically what we recommend as well as part of the agreement, uh, agreements that are in place and be it in this situation, if, you have, if your employees are exercising the options, we strongly recommend a, a USA, United Shareholders Agreement, be drafted to, to consider these items. Um, typically, there's a formula in place that says, based on the financial records of the company at this date, we will buy out your shares based on formula of net income times whatever times whatever. And, and that, that's how you determine what the value of the shares are uh, just for those kind of transactions. And so effectively, if an employee has um, exercised their options, they own shares, they're getting bought out of the company at a predetermined formula, not necessarily a predetermined price. And that's typically the easiest. Everybody signs off on it right from the beginning. And so they know what's coming when, they're, when they choose to exit. It can be good and it can be bad. If you've had a record year, uh, that means you're going to be paying more for those employees to, to be bought out. And once again, it has to be tied to a, a regular formulaic uh, process. So there, there is... Uh, support for it that you're not uh you're not undercutting your employees or or not overpaying them yeah and i've seen in, you know instead of sort of like a formula being written into the usa sort of it being written as like you know we're going to write down what the price the, what the valuation is of the company for, for each class of shares or whatever exactly. every three six twelve months or, or whatever the cadence is and then it's sort of written down on a, on a thing um but cool um Adrian's, Adrian's question um, essentially is talking about not issuing options until they've been there for a year um, versus sort of when, uh, when they, you know, on, on hiring and using it as an incentive and a carrot right off the hop to be able to entice them to join. Um, maybe you want to kind of unpack the, the vesting and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so Adrian on that, I would agree with you typically on the startup, uh, the very, very early startup stage. That's typically an entice, uh, a way to entice people to come and join the, uh, uh, the vision that you have for your company to get people started. I would say that might be an initial step though. And then from there, you would look at scaling it back. 
So, so perhaps then, then you would go once, once you get to a point where you're, where you're large enough, where you're hiring um, the receptionist and those, those type of roles as actual employees, then you would scale it back to, you want to make sure that they have a commitment to maybe the longer term goals of the company, but the initial startup, I, I don't disagree. I think you're, uh, uh, you would be, um, if you're telling them that they would get options uh, that maybe uh, in, in, in a year down the road, that could be an issue. Now, the other workaround for that is maybe you give them options with a, a stretched out vesting period. So normally you would do, uh, say, a three-month vesting period or a six-month vesting period in the future. But today you're going to go, yeah, we'll grant the options, but the vesting period is not for a year just to get to that point. Yeah, so I think that was, you know, so that, that's like um, what I've seen and what's probably pretty regular is like a one-year cliff and a four-year vesting schedule where you sort yep. of do you know, they're, they're working their way to the, they've been granted the options for a year. They don't actually get anything. And then at the 12 month mark, they get the whole year of options. And then from then on, it's sort of a monthly or ish vesting period where they get sort of the rest of them. And as Adrian was alluding to it, um, doing a quarter a year or a four year vesting period with that one year cliff um, would be pretty, pretty normal, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Four years or three uh, years. That's what fine. we see most most often is four years or three years. Yeah, we've yeah. got 30, 30, 40, and 25, 25, 25. We don't do the monthly vesting on the options. Although, I, Tim, maybe you can, or maybe either you can speak to the why that's, because that to me is a relatively new or tech focused thing where the, with the monthly vesting is previously or historically, traditionally, it was always annual vesting. Um, you know, we've gone back and forth saying people might expect this as a standard now. I haven't seen that. We've hired people with our annual vesting and no one's had an issue so far. Um, can you speak to that? Everybody that I've seen that goes to the, and, and Tim, you may, you may seem different, but everybody I've seen uh, that goes to the um, monthly vesting uh, loves it until they actually have to administer, administratively manage it. And then they go, why the heck did we do this? We should have like pushed it back to, uh, quarterly or semi-annually or just annually because it's you get to the same end result uh, but I think it's just because it sounds new and it's cool that, uh, that there's sort of this push for it but it's a lot more work than it's worth I think yeah and I mean to to take maybe a bit of the opposite position because I agree I hated men work as well um, and Justin we have to have a conversation about doing our financials from last year on that topic. <laughs> but, um, the the um, the counterpoint to that is like, you know, big annual bonuses, especially when they're all timed together for a company, which this would effectively be if you time it all together as a company, then, you know, then you have a mass, you have a propensity for a mass exodus because people will be waiting for that and then leaving. And so if you make it more higher resolution, then there's a little bit less of a windfall to, to justify a departure. Then they can leave at any time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'd rather, I'd rather that. I like to plan for it. I'd like to plan for the exodus, Tim, like get the hires in plan for the exodus. No, I, I guess for me, it's the, it's so yeah, annoying administratively. Um, and, and then, yeah, I don't want, I don't want people just waiting for like next month, next month. I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I can, you can kind of, I mean, I hope I can kind of tell when someone's thinking, Oh, I'm just putting in the time to the next vesting period. Like, okay, well, have you guys noticed what this person's doing? Like they're, they're just, they're just mailing it in waiting for the, the next year. Like, should we do something about this now? I don't know. I, I, I think there's more pros than cons. It just seems yeah. like it's trendy and popular and whatever, but uh, I don't know that it's really permeated uh, our industry in Canada yet. Like it's really a U.S. thing. So yeah. I haven't had any pushback on the annual vesting mm. whatsoever. Cool. Just from only my co-founder. He's the only one who's pushed back. And uh, <laughs> this is in our best interest and he's still fine. So. <laughs> we've gotten, Justin, we've gone into some legal areas and you're an accountant. So maybe, <laughs> maybe let's go with uh, it on an ESOP. Is there any time that anything hits the financial statements or like has any sort of accounting impact or, or where does this sort of pop up if anywhere? Yeah, so so really, I guess uh, it does show up on the financial statements, and that's going back to the question there was a, a little while ago regarding a Black Scholes calculation. Yes, you can do a Black Scholes calculation uh, for your uh, for your options uh, for a private company. Uh, it, it is it is tricky uh, only from the standpoint that um, you don't have a volatility in your stock price the way that a public company does that will have obviously constantly 
uh, fluctuating stock prices, but it can be done. Typically it's done with uh, looking at comparable companies and using their volatility and applying it to your situation. But when you do that Black-Scholes calculation or there are other options and, and I'm sure Tim in that link that you had provided probably has a few other options to look at as well. That will show up as an expense in your company. So once you calculate what the cost is, uh, associated with the options that makes its way as a current period cost to the company. And then the offsetting side is actually an equity uh, item. It's contributed surplus typically, or you can call it option uh, equity, things like that. Um, and then, uh, so that's reporting your financial statements. The only thing is it's not a tax deduction in your company's financial statements. So because you haven't really paid anything and it's not really ever going to be paid necessarily, it's more of an opportunity cost. Uh, because really what the what the Black Scholes calculation is is kind of coming down to or most of these option calculations is I'm giving you an, a, an opportunity to buy shares today at a dollar when you exercise them they're going to be worth five dollars I've lost out on four dollars of potential value that I could have got from you uh, so that's really where it comes into but and that's what shows up on your financial statements and so to 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 use more to use some specific examples. So if we were to issue, let's go back to the previous number. So there's like fifty thousand dollars of strike that we're issuing to somebody, um, which Black Scholes will argue is worth say forty thousand to use round numbers. Yep. So forty thousand is the number, not the value of the of the strike, but the the value of the options. Um, uh, we'll get to that, Adrian. The the so that forty thousand shows up when they're issued. So if, you know, if I was hiring you today, Justin, those $40,000 of options are going to be vesting over the course of the next four years. Um, do I, do I record it when they vest or do I record it when they're issued? Yeah. Only on the vesting date. So, so, but you calculate it on the grant date. So that's what makes it kind of funny is uh, on, on day one, the day that the, the options are granted, you do your calculations and then you keep that sort of in your back pocket and then once you hit those vesting dates, that's when you record the related expense. So if you're going with Adrian's example of 25, uh, 25, 25, 25 over a four year period, then each annual period, you would recognize one quarter of that expense. And typically what ends up happening is you need to have some spreadsheets put together for that because you'll have options that were issued uh, in 2022 and then you have some options issued in 2023 and 2024 and they're overlapping investing at different periods so your expense is never going to be exactly the same but for that specific stream of options that will just be recognized over that vesting period awesome and on so obviously double entry accounting you said on the on the because you're issuing equity so it goes into the equity in some whatever however you categorize like yep. surplus or options or, or whatever equity and then the other side would be like employee stock option you just like have a gl for yeah stock? that's exactly it but quite quite often it's uh it's just called stock option expense um it looks it, it, you would i would show it separately i mean you can lump it together with your uh wages and benefits if you'd like to but keeping it separately kind of make sure that those numbers don't look like they're getting very skewed in one direction and you're paying a lot of uh salaries out to your staff mm. okay Adrian, Adrian with coming in with all the questions we have, uh, the reason you know, I'll read it out for the benefit of posterity. The reason I asked about the black shoals that we're often asked what the options are worth since we know the options aren't worth anything until they're transacted and then are only worth the increment between the transaction price and the strike price is difficult to answer them. Um, and so the article that I shared, I don't know if maybe, I don't know when you joined, um, yeah, you were here for that. Um, take a peek at that. Um, it's got a pretty decent explanation, um, but the, the soft, like the qualitative component is that, you know, to use the 50,000 and 40,000 example, like I was using before the 50,000 of strike, you know, we're giving you the upside on $50,000 worth of shares without you having to pay for them. And so if you were to exercise them and like walk away today, they would of course be worth nothing, but for staying here, you're going to get the lift on that $50,000 of of shares without having to pay for them, like all the inv other investors around the table. And so the Black Shoals or whatever other math we want to use um, comes up with what the value of the upside without having to pay for it, or essentially the cost of not having, or the value of not having to risk your capital um, is worth. Uh, and there's like some math that goes into it, but at early stage, somewhere between, you know, 
two thirds and 80% of the value of the, of the value of the strike or the value of the shares that they're getting the lift on is I think justifiably um, used, but it, maybe Justin, what have you seen in terms of the value because you're seeing the re the recording of it on the financials and stuff like that. What have you seen in terms of it relative to the strike on an early stage company? Yeah, and it's it, so it it always comes down that the key factor or the key estimate that goes into it is that volatility. So if you're expecting you know hockey stick growth in your um, in the the value of the company, then the volatility related to your share price should be uh, representative of that. And, and so you'll have a massive, massive um, increase. Whereas if, you, if it's expected to be lower, then, uh, then yeah, then you won't see that same, that same expense. And kind of looking at it from the opposite direction from what you were explaining, Tim, with, with the black shoals showing the value to the employees. I always think about it because I'm often working from the company standpoint as opposed to the employee standpoint. I look at it as the black shoals is the opportunity cost to the company. If, if you were to have those shares and able to issue them to someone in the market, here's basically the chance of what you're losing out on. So if the, if the price of the stock is going, uh, bouncing up and down and going upwards, then your cost is going to be higher uh, to you as opposed to a company with a lower trajectory in stock price. Cool. But yeah, Adrian, take a peek at that, uh, take a peek at that, that article. And like I said, it'll be, we'll link it in the blog and, and stuff like that, but. Um, there's a few few different tools in there to be able to come up with triangulate on the math and some tables and stuff that that can be no, shared whatever but go for it. it no yeah i appreciate it. that's i mean i know like neo for example in town here they're giving their op their their employees and their negotiations they're giving them a table i don't know if you guys know this um already but they give them a table of salary and options and then their projected valuation as a company. So what those options could protect, I mean, it almost seems dangerous. Like you're kind of promising value, you're promising numbers to people that absolutely are, they're speculating completely in your negotiation. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that sounds just, it's dangerous or maybe disingenuous, maybe there's a lot of liability, maybe it's fine, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's a that, whole conversation there. <laughs> yeah, that feels to me that always, I always, when I saw that, uh, I, I thought it felt like a lawsuit waiting to happen. You're putting something in writing right. saying, yeah. this is what your company is going to be worth. And so I agreed to sign on on that basis and it didn't hit it. So I want my money. Yeah. So we've done something very, like someone asked us, what I was like, well, well, if, if we were to do this, we would like to do this. And if it happened, maybe this, but even that I felt really uncomfortable with but we did it i don't know hopefully it's not a lawsuit waiting to happen yeah yeah hopefully um <laughs> did, did julie had a good question i'd like to hear yeah are there performance options like can you do performance warrants for c-suite yeah let's uh let me just um so julie says this might be getting into the weeds of overall comp structure but if i can squeeze one more in have you seen anyone get creative with structuring options agreements with C-suite talent to make sure their reward is aligned with the company's best interests, i.e. sustainable progress? Uh, for example, can you add some performance metrics into the options agreement? And if so, do you think it's worth adding it for a startup or adding unnecessary complexity at an early stage? And when we talk about startup, I'm going to assume we're talking about seed-ish. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yes, you definitely can. And I would, I would typically tie it to sort of uh, the normal, and when I say normal, for a more established company, uh, metrics that you're looking at hitting just re with regarding to regular annual cash bonuses. Uh, but that's really the extent I would take it to. So if you have certain revenue targets, if you have certain new customer uh, acquisition targets, things like that, that's what I would tie it to. I have seen them get way too complicated where it's, it, we, here's our tiered levels of if we hit this target, you get this, you get 15%. And if we get this target, you get 22%. And it, once it gets too complicated, the employees kind of start to tune out. So the trick is to just have very, not necessarily easy to achieve, but easy to observe targets and, uh, and provide that to, to the employees. And like I said, whether it be revenue, whether it be customers, it depends on your company and what you're really targeting in the early stages, but that's what I would tie it to. And then maybe have a couple tiers of amount of options they receive as a result. And that would be the extent of it. I wouldn't get too much more complicated than that because it just gets, it gets too convoluted too quickly. And essentially treat it like a bonus. You know, we hit this by December, you're going to be getting, instead of like a cash bonus, you're getting a, an options type 
bonus. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. And like, it's, it's funny. I mean, the number of times I've seen these agreements start off with the best of intentions and then get way too, um, way too complicated is it happens so often. You just have to rein it back and, and cut out pages and pages of explanations for situations. Okay. And actually, cause this came up and, and people often get confused. So options versus warrants. Do you know, you know what the technical difference is there? Really nothing. <laughs> the, 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 the naming so, of them. The, they're, the, they're, the, the finance guy and me options. It's sort of like futures versus, uh, Oh shit. Whatever the other one is, it's essentially the same name. Futures and forwards. Yeah. That's, that's basically one, yeah. what it is. Yeah. It, it's uh, they're the same thing. Typically though, options are options are for whatever reason used more often with employees, whereas warrants are used for uh, vendors, contractors, or when they're tied to some sort of equity race and sell. So quite often you'll have units that are issued as opposed to actually issuing um, just warrants or sorry, just shares, I should say, where each unit consists of one share and one warrant to purchase another share subsequently. And so the warrants versus options, the like technical difference, it's sort of like square versus rectangle, but the, an option is, but it, it, so, uh, an option is like, if you have an option to, to purchase a whatever, you know, you have an option to purchase a share at a future date. And so an option is like, We'll call it the rectangle definition and a warrant is when it's issued by the company and so if your option is with the company as the counterparty then it's a warrant and whereas you know if if justin owns shares of a company and there's like public company options that exist and so they're between me and justin instead of me and the company if it's between me and justin it's an option if it's between me and the company it's a warrant and that's the like nomenclature right. but options issued by the company are still options they are still options Yep, that, that's exactly it. And, and typically what ends up happening in these situations is options don't have to be, but they're quite often um, free, so to speak, whereas warrants will have some kind of cost associated with them too. Well, it really makes sense in the public trading, or I guess even probably it makes sense if, if I'm an individual that doesn't have any of the shares and I can still sell a warrant to that company's, to somebody for that company. Yeah. If they want, and if they want to exercise it, they can, yeah. Exactly. I hadn't thought of that. Tim, that was perfect. That was the best way I've heard it describe the difference. Because yeah, to me, they seem exactly the same, really. But that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Justin, is there anything that we didn't talk about that's that's on your mind around ESOPs and, and stuff like that? No, you know what? I guess I, I would say um, just kind of one last one last item because I mean it's all been accountant talk uh, this entire time. Lawyers are so key in this process. They, they could, uh, the accountants, they're, they're great to have there. And we talk about the tax consequences and everything you need to be worried about. But the lawyers make sure everything gets papered up and, and documented properly. And there's a lot of different areas that, that come into this. Not only do you have to worry about your option agreement and how, how the, the options are going to be granted, invested, and those kind of things, but they make sure that you have. Uh, everything documented with going back to Tim, your, your question earlier about um, what happens when an employee leaves, what uh, they, they'll be involved in the drafting of the USA, the issuance of the additional classes of shares and all those kind of things, they all come into play. So you need to have a good lawyer involved in this who understands what they're doing and making sure they can put it together. Because just because someone's a corporate lawyer doesn't mean they have any experience and options. Quite often, lawyers will be involved just with private companies that don't issue these options. And so you need someone who's specialized in this space, or at least has a good knowledge base. Behind them. Yeah, startup lawyer versus just general corporate lawyer is a very, yes. very big difference. Yeah, yeah, I've seen people. But really, the, but really the, learning, the takeaway there is don't require unanimous 100% approval on your shareholder agreement, right? Like No, no, no. And uh, quite often they don't. Uh, but what does come up into play sometimes is just things people aren't thinking about, right? Where, where, or if it's a two thirds or majority or things like that, sometimes, sometimes they, they can put you in the wrong situation, but you still need that USA uh, and, and have everything documented there. That's so key. And sometimes it's like number of hands instead of number of shares, which then gets yeah. tricky when you have a whole ton yeah. of employees and a few and few investors and a few key decision makers. And, and there's anyway. different ways of slicing. There's clearly different ways of slicing it, right? Like we've we've sliced it one way that we think is going to work, but yeah, I guess we'll find out in the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah it's, it usually, I mean, you can you can't plan for absolutely everything, but if you've got a lawyer who's been through it a number of times, they'll have seen the the outcomes and they'll know to make sure to draft it properly. 
Yeah. Yeah. More, moral of the story. I, I asked Justin a bunch of uh, curveball lawyer questions and, and he, he, he knew enough to be able to handle it, but definitely hire a lawyer. But moral of the story is that Justin clearly has enough context on the startup side to be able to have the conversation, um, which is fantastic. So thanks. Thanks, Justin, for, for spending 75 minutes here and, and chatting about ESOP. Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get some questions separately and, and stuff like that. And we'll get that blog up and, and maybe there'll be some comments that you can hop in and answer some Absolutely. questions. And if people want to reach out to you and, and dive in a little bit more on their specific circumstances, how, how, how should they get a hold of you? You know what? Probably the easiest way is uh, just, just email me kind of going back to what you're saying initially. I'm always quick on the email responses. So if you do have questions uh, you can send me an email uh, jrusso at krpgroup.com. We've got our, uh, our website, my email contact information is up there as well. So feel free to reach out. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can just look for me there as well. That's, uh, that's an easy way to get a hold of me also. Beauty. Well, thanks. Thanks again, Justin. And thanks everybody for, for coming in and, and taking a peek at the nuances of ESOPs. Thanks very okay. much. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Justin. Thank, Thank you. you.